Welcome to the Fundamentals of Loop Playing. My name is Loudon Schuett, and today we're going to be talking about rhetoric and interpretation. Now, before we dive in, I just want to say two things about rhetoric. I think for those of you who are not experienced musicians, rhetoric may come across as sort of a negative thing. We maybe hear that word in the context of politicians saying things that aren't uh, necessarily things they actually believe, or they're, they're sort of pandering to the audience. Um, rhetoric in the 16th century is really an art form. It is the art of persuasion. It's used in acting. It's used in speeches. It's used in music. So it doesn't quite have the negative connotations that we've, we've sort of come to associate with it. I think now we tend to like people when they speak from the heart. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the different layers of rhetoric because there are different types of rhetoric. You're supposed to use sort of high level rhetoric when speaking to certain audiences and low level rhetoric to uh, sort of uh, working class people. That's at least the way it's described. Um, for those of you who are experienced musicians or maybe even early musicians, you may have heard the word rhetoric thrown around a lot. Um, people will say, oh, we have to play in a rhetorical manner, or we have to use rhetoric as our guide. And what I often find frustrating in those cases is that while we often talk about rhetoric in music, we don't get into the nuts and bolts, the terminology, the actual um, sort of... Uh, not rules, but guidelines for you to follow as a performer. More often than not, it's sort of, well, we're going to play in a rhetorical way. Um, so we're going to get into some of the nuts and bolts today. We're going to cover um, some of what I think are the most essential terms and figures for you to know as a lute player. There are more if you are working with a singer. Um, I will put links to the the books of Robert Toft, which are especially influential as a, as a modern writer. He's gone back and done a tremendous amount of work to sort of connect rhetoric to music, and um, it's just been a fantastic resource. There are also period resources that I will put some links up uh, to that describe rhetoric, and you can explore that as well. So let's dive into it a little bit. Some of you coming to early music from classical guitar or maybe another instrument might notice that there are very, very few performance indications in early music. I mean, often you just have the tablature, you have the score, and there's nothing saying to play loud, there's nothing saying to play soft, there are no staccato markings, there are very few, especially in the Renaissance. That does start to change a bit in the Baroque period. Um, and you may think to yourself, wow, does this mean that they didn't use dynamics? Does this mean they didn't use color? Does it mean they didn't use articulation? Well, they did. Um, and actually, what's interesting is that it was just more standardized at the time. And in fact, when you see instructions for when to play loud or when to play softly or when to articulate, often it is against the norm. And that's why they're writing it in to make sure you understand, okay, normally you would do this other thing. But here I want you to do something completely different. Now, one other thing I'm going to say, and I think this is really, really, really important. So uh, you're going to watch this video and some people may watch the video and go, oh my gosh, I have to do that every single time. That seems very constrictive. Um, you don't. What this is about is figuring out what the standard way of doing something was, and then you could make the decision to deviate from that. So for example, if the standard way of playing something is to get louder as you go up, but you've decided in a particular piece of music that you would like to do the opposite, that's absolutely fine. The idea here is to give you information, to give you guidelines, and then when you decide to break them, it's, it's done with knowledge. They certainly did, and when you incorporate things like text, for example, if you're working with a singer, um, often you do find many situations where it's a great idea to break from the norm, but let's learn the norm first. So rhetorical figures, um, I've included a handout in the description that you can link to, and it just has short descriptions of each of these figures we're going to go over. Um, the first figure you will see in the handout is called gradatio. Now gradatio is actually a pretty, uh, I like to think it was a very intuitive figure. I think it makes a lot of sense. The idea is simply that as we go up, we get louder. And then as we go down, we get 
softer. And not only can that be done in a sort of stepwise way, um, it can also be a repeated phrase or a sequence. Now, in the, in the case of gradatio, that sequence will always be by step. Now, if you are thinking, well, does he, what about half step? What about whole step? Doesn't matter. So it just needs to be by step. So for example, you could have something like this. have this sequence going up and I think the first time was a half step and the second time I went up a, a whole step. So when you're looking at gradatio the idea is very very simple. If you see a musical line going up you get louder. If you see a musical line going down you get softer. If you see a repeated phrase at, at a stepwise level just like I played so the phrase is the, the sequence or phrase is it's just this and then I repeat it up a step, and then I repeat it up a step more, and that's that's gradatio. Now when it's um, more than a step, we'll talk about that in just a few moments. Now, it, where would be places where you could do the opposite? Well, um, let's say, for example, you were working with a singer and their line was, and their soul went up to heaven, and they're singing, you know, they're going, you might want to do the opposite, like a kind of an ethereal quality. So nine times out of 10, if you're, if you're ascending, um, particularly in stepwise motion, you are going to be increasing in volume. And when you're descending, you're going to be decreasing in volume. And this is all within context. This is not something you have to blindly follow. It's interesting because a lot of lute sources will say things like, you know, always pluck the lute strongly, always give, give voice to the notes. So this is about context. It's about um, listening to what you're playing and just understanding that that is a useful guideline for you. Now, the next figure we're going to talk about is called Palologia. Um, I should say pronunciation wise, uh, I've, I've tried to look up some of the pronunciations on this and maybe I say something a little bit wrong with the, with the pronunciation of the figures. Uh, if somebody wants to correct me, they're welcome to, but I've always just say Palologia. The most important thing is just that you know the figures. Now Palologia is an interesting one. Because I think as modern listeners, especially to music like Vivaldi, we have very strong opinions. If you were to listen to most modern recordings of like Vivaldi, if you had a figure like this and it repeated. So polylogia is what do we do when we have a figure or a, or a little phrase or subphrase and it repeats exactly at the same level. So right now I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm just going to show you what I mean. So you might think to yourself, okay, so what can we do with this? And if you've listened to a lot of early music recordings, especially from earlier generations, from maybe the 70s or earlier, you might be used to the echo, which is... And that might, you might think is standard, but actually it was the opposite. So um, if, a, if a phrase is repeated, it was actually more common for them to do this. As a reinforcement. And you know, this took me a little while to kind of understand because I'm so used to hearing the echo. And just to be clear, they did use echoes. Um, they are very commonly notated in a couple different ways. In the lute tablature, if they want an echo, an interesting thing they sometimes do is they'll take a note or a, or a passage and they'll play it in first position where it's nice and bright and then they'll maybe move it up higher for the echo so you get this nice dull quiet sound and then in standard notation they'll actually write um, forte and piano. I know Bach does that um, down the road in the Baroque music as you start seeing some dynamic indications when it goes against the norm. Um, so this takes a little getting used to and I think one, uh, I don't remember who I heard, first heard give this description, maybe it was uh, Paul Odette, my, my former teacher, but it was something along the lines of, well, imagine that you're asking your kid to clean the room and the first time you say, clean your room and they're not doing anything. And then you go, clean your room clean your room and you just say it louder as it goes so it's this sort of 
um, reinforcement of what you've already said. You know, maybe maybe the text is something like "I love you," and it just gets stronger and stronger as you're saying it. So that's the standard. They did use echoes, but that's something to be aware of. Um, it was not the standard to do echoes. It would be the standard to do a reinforcement. So when you're making that decision in your own music, just ask yourself, okay, what works best in this context? And obviously if it's a piece called the echo, you might want to consider an echo. Um, so the next figure is called Articulus, and this is actually a very um, expansive um, topic. It covers a lot of things. And basically what Articulus describes is when is it appropriate to shorten notes? And by shortened notes, for those musicians out there, we're talking about, you know, a staccato. And it could be a staccato that shaves just a little bit of the note off, or it could be quite a short note. I mean, we could have everything from to you know, you could do all sorts of varieties of shortening depending on the speed of the piece, the character of the piece. Is it a dance? Is it a lugubrious pattern? You know, where, where we've got this, this very slow lines moving while well, having a very short, very short note in that would might sound quite awkward. So you'll have to think about the context, but here are some general rules to follow. When you have a leap, the note that precedes the leap, so for example, let's say I'm going from G to C. Now, just to clarify, let's put that G on a weak beat. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna play two Gs. There we go, or you could even go A. That way there's absolutely no confusion with what I'm gonna say next. So let's say we go one, two, three. Four. Now you'll notice beat two, I shortened. And I think that can be shorter the faster you go. Or let's say we're doing a very slow piece. Maybe that was a little too short for that. And playing around with how long. All the way to just not. which is totally a legitimate uh, interpretation of Articulus. So the idea with this first part of Articulus is that if you have a leap, the note that precedes the leap can be shortened. Um, this is really, really nice for dances, for jigs, and all sorts of things. It's often uh, very helpful when working with singers and they've got sort of uh, unaccented or throwaway syllables on um, weak beats going to a, a strong beat. Now the other context in which you can shorten a note is when you have repeated notes. And again here, and what I, I should actually clarify that we generally only want to shorten the note if it lands on a weak beat. So let's say for example we have a leap that goes one, two. So the leap starts on one, and goes to B2. Well, in that case, hopefully what we've got is a note that follows B2, and you shorten B2. So in general, we're only gonna to wanna to shorten weak beats. Now let's say you don't have anything following uh, B2, that it's a tied note, it's held across. Then I probably wouldn't shorten either of them. But again, it's going to depend on the context and what's going on. Are we still counting the same way? Are we in some sort of hemiola? Is there a, what we used to jokingly call a semiola, a situation where we've got a syncopation popping out in the voice? So it's going to depend on the context. But in general, these shortened notes are going to occur on weak beats or on the ands of beats. So for example, if I go one, two, and three, four. So lots of nuance, lots of context, uh, lots of places to talk about this. So I may be expecting some questions in the, um, in the comment section here on this one. Now the other context is repeated notes. So if I'm going one, two, three, four, and I'm gonna really exaggerate this. Um, we're looking at shortening beats two and four. 
And this is really nice when you have something like and you can always, I think in the context of repeated notes, you can basically shorten any of the repeated notes that occurs after the first one on a strong beat. So what do I mean by that? So for example, if I have one, two, three, four, five, six, you can have that first one be strong or full or tenuto or full length in time. And then the ones following it, all sort of shortened. And that's really nice for things like um, hunt music. Uh, some of you may have noticed I posted a video with the Scottish hunts up. Um, it's really nice for military um, sort of imitation music and things like that. Or for, for other contexts, you could always go long, short, long, short, long, short. It's just gonna depend on the character you're trying to create. But in the, the context of repeated notes, um, you can shorten anything after that first strong beat, even the strong beats that follow after it. And I think that's a, a nice effect. Okay, the next figure is called consentus. And all that is, is it's a fancy word for um, two or more notes sounding at the same time. Now that can be simultaneous, like a chord or a full voice chord. It can also be a context where you pluck a note and you hold that note while move, while plucking the next note after it. As long as there are two pitches sounding at the same time or more, you have consentus. And I think this is a nice um, word to use sometimes instead of chord. I've, I've seen a couple comments about, you know, what does chord mean? You know, hey, I thought this is counterpoint. We don't have chords at this point. This kind of dodges that. I'll often use the term chord um, in sort of the classical theoretical sense, which is two or more notes sounding at the same time. Uh, but some people may think of chord as literally being the thing. You strum like on a lute or a guitar. Um, in, in almost every uh, context that I'll be talking about it, I'm going to be meaning uh, two or more notes sounding simultaneously at, at some given point. So that means being plucked at the same time or plucked separately, but they're left to ring out. And consentus covers that nicely, so it's a good, um, it's a good word to use. Now, the next figure is called heterolepsis. Um, and this is an interesting one because we tend to think in the Renaissance that we don't, uh, we always prepare dissonances. They're always approached by staff or they come from a preceding chord. We're very much used to things like this. But this isn't entirely true. Um, there are contexts where you can have an unprepared dissonance. I, I think the most common that I often see are situations like where you have a C major chord and then immediately the seventh, the flat seven is thrown in, B flat. Now that was not approached by step, I didn't go. And it was not prepared. I'm literally going from the chord and hitting the B flat. Now this could be in any direction, and it's always a leap with hetero uh, with heterolepsis, um, and we want to emphasize that dissonance. Now, if you are completely confused about what I'm talking about, if you're like, "Oh my gosh, what is he talking about with dissonance and all of this stuff?" Um, I've again, I've put a link to Artuzzi in here, which is a sort of um, music theory course, free. It's online. You can sign up. Um, and it will catch you up on, on about, I don't know, three or four semesters of undergraduate music theory. So that way you kind of um, have that background to understand what I'm talking about. But uh, on a basic level, a dissonant note is one that doesn't necessarily sound harmonious. It doesn't sound nice. If you listen to the C major chord, all of the chords, all the notes blend nicely. But well, then I throw in the B flat on top. It has this kind of um, tense quality to it that is then resolved here. So heterolepsis just means a leap into a dissonance, an unprepared dissonance. And instead of shying away from that, instead of being very kind of careful, 
we want to actually emphasize it. So whether it's on a strong beat, on a weak beat, doesn't matter. If it's on a weak beat, then it almost becomes a little bit of a, a syncopation. It's kind of interesting. Um, Mutatio toni um, is the next figure we're going to talk about. And I'm always trying to think of good examples from the literature. I think um, something like that might be quite, quite interesting. So what's going on here is that we are going from a, from chords that are within the key or within the mode that we're playing and then suddenly going outside of that. So for example, uh, here I'm playing basically a C chord without the third and then I'm playing G major and then E major. So, so if you're coming from this, sounds very striking it sounds very whoa where did that come from and and so these are rare moments in the music and I think the biggest thing for you to remember is that when you run into something like that don't shy away from it don't go and sort of hide from it um, instead I would bring it out you know I have something like that oh there's a parallel oh, oh, oh. to work on that a little bit um, so what you want to do is make sure that when you have this mutation, this mutatio toni, that you emphasize the, the chord change, that you change um, the, the sound, the color to bring it out. Okay, paresia. Paresia is uh, just a term that's used for stepwise preparation of dissonance. Um, and also includes what we would call false relations. So for example, if I had an F sharp in the bass, and then I played an F natural on top. As long as that F sharp is still ringing, you know, not necessarily going to be that strong, but sometimes it is. I can think of a, um, I believe it was, Michelangelo Gallet has a prelude where he's got all of these prepared um, dissonances, and I think there are some true false relations in there. Um, when you have F sharp going to F natural, and it can be simultaneous, or it can just be that the F sharp is still ringing out. Quite striking. You see this a lot in, in vocal music. Um, the other option would be a situation where you have something like tritone um, being formed or another dissonance like that. Now the thing that sets this apart from heterolepsis is that we are approaching things by step or they are prepared. So these are the types of dissonances that we, when we take a counterpoint class in undergrad, that's kind of what we're taught is the Renaissance um, uh, sort of standard way of handling dissonance. So in particular, Paragia is going to be talking about false relation when you have two versions of the same note sounding at the same time, F sharp, F natural, uh, we can do the opposite too. Which is, I don't see that as often to be honest, but probably happens. More often I see the, the sharp version in the bass and the natural version on top, but who's to say it, it doesn't happen. Um, and then the other thing is the, the tritone. So having this sound, and that's a tritone plus an octave um, for those of you who are like, wow, that seems really wide to be a tritone. Um, we still call it a tritone. So. So approached by step, A flat, D. So we're going to go. And what we end up with is that. Now we could do it simultaneously. And you have that beautiful. And you could resolve there. Which is nice. So just think of Paragia as your way to talk about um, 
dissonance in sort of stepwise motion as it's prepped. The, this other figure I, I almost didn't include because in loop music, um, oh no, sorry, we're going to do pathopoeia first. Pathopoeia is very simple. It is just a fancy word for chromaticism. Um, it's just playing. And I think the one thing I would say about this is, again, this is something we want to emphasize when you start to hear something chromatic. It's not something we want to shy away from and, and worry that it doesn't sound good. This is definitely emphasized. Um, and in general, it's legato. So what do I mean by that? Sometimes I, I think um, when I hear modern players and people coming from maybe a 19th century or 20th century background, I often hear um, that people want to make every note really clear in the chromatic line. So they will go sort of shortening each of the notes. Um, in this period, it was more common. It's not universal, but it's more common to... Remember that leaps are emphasized by shortening notes and this sort of chromatic motion, we really want to be super legato most of the time. I'm sure there are exceptions. If you're a violinist, um, you know, there, I, I can't remember the treatise, but literally, maybe it's actually Leopold Mozart um, says, you know, in his treatise, I think, I'll have, to ha I'll have to double check that, but literally slide. And you know, that's not what we're gonna do on the lute, but but really connecting those notes. So I think that might be the one difference from a modern approach to chromatic music. Um, it's the next figure that I debated on whether I should include or not, and this is uh, prolongatio. And the idea here is just that it's a really long dissonance. You're gonna run into this a lot if you're doing lute song, um, where you have a singer holding a high note, and you might be doing something like this. Or something like, let's see, what would be the best way to show this? They might have something like, I'll have to re-strike the note to make it clear. So the chords are changing underneath. And that's just one note being held by the singer. And the idea with this is that when it is dissonant against the bass, so I'll play that again for you. So we start off with a C major chord and the singer singing G. And then I play an F chord underneath. Now the singer's still singing G, but they've now crescendoed to match this dissonance. And then now maybe we're onto a G7. So they might still want a crescendo, maybe even higher, and then resolve when we get back to the C chord. Now on the lute, um, what you're going to see is those notes are going to be restruck, just like I was restriking them. And I, I, I think that's where prolongation um, comes into play. Really, this is a, a multiple measure dissonance. So um, it's not super common. You'll see it in vocal um, arrangements on the lute and things like that, where you just have one note being hit, things like motets, um, you just see that G over and over again. And so what you want to do as a lute player is really bring it out. And just pretend that you're a singer who is crescendoing on that single note and then decrescendoing where it's necessary. So just one to be aware of. Um, the last one is synonymia. And synonymia is actually very similar to gradatio. The only difference is that instead of um, stepwise motion, it's leaps. And really, uh, all you need to remember is that if you play a figure, uh, and I should say that um, Synonymia only refers to a repeated phrase. So for example, if I have a phrase like, okay, or a figure, um, we go. So we have one that kind of starts in the middle. So sort of, sort of a mezzo forte, and then we go down. Maybe we're down here. And then, 
So your, your dynamics are going to match um, where that figure is played in relation to the other figures at different levels. And again, you can always deviate from that. You could do something like... That's fine. You know, you can, you can make that decision. The idea with these rhetorical terms is that it gives you a way to communicate what you're thinking about in the music and how to approach the music. Um, I think one of my big complaints is you'll hear critics say over and over, oh, they were in tune, they sounded nice. They, they don't have the language to talk about the music. And I see the same thing with students. So if a student is looking at a lute piece and you know we're talking about a measure, they may not be comfortable enough to say, hey, listen, um, I feel like there's a lot of articulus we could explore in this measure. Or I notice that there's some heterolepsis here and I'd really like to bring out that dissonance. Or, you know, Grenatio, I know it normally gets louder as you go up, but I'm really feeling like I want to get softer. I think this is a very special moment. So um, expanding your language and the ability to talk about the music you're playing um, gives you a lot of power. And what I would say is first experiment with the standard way of doing things. Uh, maybe you're working on your green sleeves. I'm shortly going to be releasing the uh, third piece for people to look on, which will actually be two pieces of a super treble and then uh, the first piece with um, two notes at the same time being played. Uh, you can start to incorporate some of these ideas and play around with it. Um, and then once you're comfortable with what is the normal way of doing things, then you, you deviate. So as always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. I'd be happy to answer them. This is a huge topic. Um, it covers a lot of ground and finding exact examples and, and making it clear is sometimes difficult. So I'm always happy to do more to help you guys out with that. Um, and if you would like to support this page. Uh, as always, the best way to do that is to subscribe. I've also set up a Patreon um, if anyone wants to do that, and I'll include that link in the description. So happy looting, happy practicing, and I'll see you for the next episode. Bye-bye.